We're in a series called In My Element, and today we're going to talk about roadblocks to prayer. Roadblocks to prayer. Father, thank you for the word. I ask that the Holy Spirit would come and breathe life into the word of God today. Lord, captivate every heart, every mind to hear the word. Lord, transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, 24-hour prayer meeting is coming. A lot of people attend it. A lot of people don't. I'm double dog daring you to sign up for the 24 hour prayer meeting. Sign up, half hour, sign up. Come for 15 minutes, come for an hour. Some people are here for six hours and they're praying and seeking the Lord. Don't dismiss yourself from it. It's powerful. And we're actually gonna involve fasting this time. We're gonna fast and pray. <clears throat> we're not gonna eat is what that means for some of you that don't know. We're not praying fast. We're, we're fasting <laughs> and praying, okay? All right, just wanna make sure. Matthew chapter six, verse five. Jesus is teaching on prayer. And he says, when you pray, uh, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand praying in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your room. When you shut your door, pray to your fathers in the secret place. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, for your father knows the things you need before you ask. In this manner, therefore pray. So we started in my element with the very first message was God is expecting to hear from us. Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, over and over again, when you pray, when you pray. And then he goes on to teach about when you fast, which we're going to talk about fasting in the next few weeks because it's so, it's a lost art in the, in the American church, by and large. The American church doesn't fast much. And it's so powerful, uh, and, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, God's expecting to hear your voice. He wants to hear from you. He loves to hear from you. And so the problem is there are roadblocks that get in the way. We get pulled. Watch this. If I grab a fish and I take a fish out of the lake and I bring him on the land and set him on the land, what will happen to him? First, he'll flop around, then he dies. In Christ Jesus is where we are supposed to be living. If we've received Jesus as Lord, we're supposed to live in him. The element of prayer and worship in the word of God is like oxygen for us. The enemy's goal, hell's goal, is to pull the believer out of his element so that he can't, he can't fight and function the way that God has intended him to fight. Four roadblocks we're going to talk about today. Four roadblocks. And by the way, this is an extensive list. There's probably more. But I'm going to hit four big roadblocks uh, for our prayer life. Number one. Roadblock number one, it's real simple, is sin. You have a vertical problem. Watch this. You have a problem between you and the Lord. The Bible says the Lord sits in heaven enthroned above all things. You have a problem with him. It is a vertical issue. And the way that you deal with it is by repenting and confessing your sins to him. And, and I'm not talking about struggling with, with, with fighting sin. With You get knocked down, you stand back up by his grace, and you keep resisting and fighting. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sin that we give into that we don't call sin anymore. Sin that we don't resist. Sin that we say, well, the grace of God covers me. I'm okay. I can continue to do this. How many know that that's going to block a little bit of your intimacy with the Lord and your relationship with the Lord? Hey, husbands, if you went and told your wife, hey, I got this girl on the side. Huh? Wives, how do you feel about your husband? How do you think intimacy with your husband's going to be? Why? Because that's not the way God intended us to live. He, he called us to live with him and to follow after him with all of our hearts. First John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Wow, that's kind of a harsh, how many go, that's a harsh verse? Pow, that's like a right hook. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Watch this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God, and it also impacts our relationships with other people because we're now living in the power of the Spirit of God in relationship with Him. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. You can be a born-again Christian, have Jesus in your heart, be saved, and not be walking with God. 
You can be saved. You can, you can know Jesus. You, you said yes to him. You served him for a little while, but you have areas and pockets of your heart that you, are, that you say are off limits to him. Or there are things in the world, sinful stuff that you've agreed with and you haven't repented of, and you need to watch this. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be what? Wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the, from the, from the presence of the Lord. When I repent of my sins, look, look at God's heart. Look what God wants to do with his people and with you. He wants to pour out his presence on you. He wants to refresh you. And the Bible says that we're to repent. And what does repent mean? I've told you this many times, but we're going to talk about it again. Repent means to turn around, to change your mind. So watch, if I'm walking in this direction, I'm believing lies of the enemy. I'm involved in sinful things I shouldn't be involved in. I'm, I'm walking in ways I shouldn't be walking with. I'm agreeing with stuff that I shouldn't be agreeing with, that when I realize it, I repent. Well, what's that mean? People say all the time, he did a 360 for Jesus. I'm like, no, we don't do 360s for Jesus, right? Because a 360 is, right? We don't do 360s for Jesus. We change our mind. Watch, I'm reading the word. Something jumps out at me, and the Lord convicts me of something. I repent. What does it mean? It means I change my mind about how I felt about this. Now the word of truth is in me. So watch, I do this. I change my mind. I walk in the other direction. I repent. Lord, this is sin. Forgive me. And now, how many of you know that the enemy will come and fight you a little bit? You keep moving. You fall down, you get back up, and you fight. God wants to change the way that we think. So, some, oh. the joy, listen, I'm going to hold that one for a second in my back pocket. I might break it out later on. The joy of repentance. Some of you go, some pe preachers preach repentance in hell like they were born in hell, like they've been there. You got to repent and they make it all heavy. And I'm like, repenting, look right here. Repenting is joyful. I have somewhere to go to lay my burdens down. I have somewhere to go to cast my sin upon. I have somewhere to go for change so that my mind can, can the Bible says to renew your mind in Christ Jesus. Renew your mind. Renew the way you think. Re repentance is joyful. I'm driving down the road. God convicts me of something. I repent. I go, Lord, thank you so much that you love me so much that you would share that with me. I gladly repent when the Lord shows me something. Why? Because it means life. It means that I'm going to get a little closer and, and the, the, the spirit of the Lord, times of refreshing, is going to be poured out. I believe that's why the church, I'm going to say something crazy. I believe that's why the body of Christ in America doesn't experience real powerful revival because we are in bed with too many things that dishonor the Lord. That's kind of a violent picture I just showed you but it, with a word picture, but it's true. 70% of the church is trapped in pornography on any given Sunday, any given service. Trapped in pornography. We agree with stuff from the world. We laugh at things maybe we shouldn't laugh at. We bring stuff into our homes maybe we shouldn't bring into our homes. And the Lord like, man, I want to do so much more, but you guys are hanging on to so much stuff, and I just want you to repent of it so that I can come in a greater fashion in your life. Amen? Amen. So repent and turn away and change your mind. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. This is why repentance is, repentance is great. God shows me something in the word and my, my mind's been believing this lie or believing that I'm doing okay and I read it in the word, I get convicted, I change my mind. Guess what? I just went from death to life by repenting. It's good for you. Keep short accounts with God. Man, just be quick to repent when God brings something to your mind. Amen? Roadblock number two. Unbelief and wrong motives. Unbelief and wrong motives. So watch this. You have a vertical problem. You either have a vertical problem or you have an internal problem. Something inside of your heart that's messed up where your motives are wrong, where you have unbelief. And I'm going to talk about how to get over the unbelief and to deal with your wrong motives. I'm going to read you two scriptures. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus is casting a demon out. And he says to the father, watch what he says to the, the dad of this boy. Jesus said to him, if you believe... 
All things are possible to him who believes. How many things? Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. How many of you ever feel like you got belief and unbelief in the same vehicle? You come in the prayer room, you're seeking God, you leave, you feel so powerful, so anointed. You get to Safeway, five minutes away. And all of a sudden you start to feel like, oh man, the world, and pretty soon you don't feel so powerful. Watch. I always say this, there's a little unbelief in us because we have to deal with our flesh. Our flesh doesn't want to believe. So the father's like, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, but God, I want you to know, this is so good. He confesses to the Lord, like we hide stuff from the Lord, don't we? I'm in here praying and the Lord, you know, hey, you, you probably should deal with this. Well, no, I'm good, Lord, I'm good. And he's like, dude, I just told you you're not good. Right? You're not good. It's, it's good to say, to confess that stuff. Lord, I believe, I really believe, but God, there's a part of me that has unbelief. That's how you overcome it, by the way, is keep coming to Jesus, keep coming to Jesus. James 4.1 says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? That's a great question. By the way, this is a letter to a church. How many know churches fight? Anybody? Anybody know anybody that's ever left a church angry? <laughs> See the laughter that happens? Yeah, it's because we're children. We're so immature. We get offended over the eat, just every little thing. <laughs> God's, trying to, God's trying to pour out times of refreshing on the church, and the church is just too busy pay, playing police with each other. Yep. Offended, 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 offended. I'm offended, I'm offended, I'm offended. I'm offended at everything. You ever been around people that are offended at everything? They're just offended all the time. It doesn't matter what happens. They're offended. Stop it. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive. This is big. How many have ever prayed something and you never received it? Watch. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Lord, if I win the lottery, I will, I will tithe 10% to the church. <clears throat> no, you won't. You won't. If you can't tithe 100, there is no way you're tithing $18 million. Right? We all pray it, right? Oh, Lord, if I just go to Vegas, the Lord told me to go to Vegas and... Ooh. bet on black and, and oh if I win I'm going to give money to the church no you're not you're not if you, I always tell people if you, I believe in tithing Okay, I believe it's a biblical principle I don't believe it's a law I believe it's a principle long before the law was ever put into place if, you, if you're making $100 a week and you 10% of that is $10 and if you say oh Lord I'm gonna, I'll give millions no, you won't, because if you can't give 10 out of 100, you're not giving 18 million out of 180 million. Imagine writing that check when... <laughs> Lord, I just... In the name of Jesus... And we even sound spiritual when we're asking for wrong things. <laughs> Father, I... Oh, Lord. You know how we, we get King James, too, when we start <laughs> wanting to convince the Lord, right? Father, if I prayeth unto thee, if today if... Lord, that 1967 GT500 Mustang if. <laughs> Lord, here's a picture of it on my phone. Let me show you the one I'm looking at. And the Lord goes, I love you. You're so cute. <laughs> you ask because you have wrong motives. How about now let's get serious? How about this? Lord, I pray for that person. I've heard people pray this way. Strip them of all that they have and humble them. I've, by the way, I've never prayed that for somebody because I know that prayers are like swords. They come back. So I, you know, oh Lord, I pray that you would humble them and I pray that you would strip them and, and da, 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 da. And then the Lord's like, why? Well, because they were mean to me. Have you ever been mean to somebody? Yes. Well, shall I strip you too? Lord, I pray for mercy for them. I pray for kindness. I pray for goodness. I pray for gentleness to come upon. See what I mean? We pray from the wrong heart. 
We pray wrong things, and, and then we get mad at the Lord because he didn't answer our wrong prayer. John chapter 15, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Why? Because the word transforms our minds and our desires. So then we start praying on target because we're praying kingdom stuff instead of just our stuff. So I've got to get in there and deal with them motives. Amen? We, come, we overcome wrong motives by confessing and receiving, just like the fa- that, that father that went to Jesus. I believe, help my unbelief. Confess it's there and ask God to remove it. Hebrews 12, 2, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God started his friendship with you and relationship with you. He's going to strengthen his friendship with you, and he's going to end it. He wants to give more faith to you. How many of you just want bigger faith? I was praying to the Lord the other day. I was like, man, I just want, I just want big faith, God. When you say something, I want to believe it. I don't want to believe it and then not do it. I want to believe. And he's like, let's do this. Get in my word. Get more faith in your heart. Amen. Roadblock number three. This is a good one. Spiritual battle. You're battling the enemy, the devil. Watch this. Pastor Matt killed it last weekend, did a great job. He touched on this. I want to hit on it again. The book of Daniel, when Daniel prays to the Lord and starts to go after God, listen what this angel comes 21 days after his prayer. And listen what happens. Daniel 10, 12. Then he continued, the angel, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of Persia of the kingdom resisted me 21 days. I'm going to say some crazy radical stuff, but I believe it. I believe the reason why the enemy attacks prayer and worship and the word so hard in a believer's life is because it is the very life source of us as, as the children of God. Good Bible studies are fantastic. Studying the Bible, do it. It's amazing. But I'm telling you, without prayer and worship, without the breath of the Spirit on what you're studying, it's just studying. It doesn't transform. The enemy wants to fight anyone who is about prayer, who is about worship. And and I'm telling you, our church is a praying, worshiping church, and we have gotten into so many fights with the enemy over the last couple years and so much crazy stuff. I I told somebody the other day, I said, we have disturbed the religious spirit in this area. It's not friendly and happy right now. We have have disturbed the subtle, just go to church and just sit and just listen. Oh, Oh, that's good. Yeah. How do I get rich? Oh yeah. Let me write that down. Oh, that's good. Sing a couple songs, go home unaffected, but I punched my my church card, and the Lord's going, hey, I need my people to step up, I need my people to pray, and as soon as we start, the enemy starts buffeting and resisting people, why? Because I'm going to tell you who the enemy's attacked in our church over the last two years, anybody that's, anyone that's a prayer warrior, I'm sure you've all been attacked. But anybody that's a prayer warrior, why? Because he knows, the enemy knows that that's what's going to bring revival and a great awakening to this area. He knows it's going to be a people like you that rise up and say, enough is enough. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. And and I'm going to do it because God's asked me to do it. And it ushers in the presence of the Lord. The enemy has literally attacked. We went through the list of, of key people in the church that are prayer warriors. It's like, it's just been boom, 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 down the list. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think the enemy smells it in the air. He knows what's coming. He can see it. Matter of fact, I was talking to a guy, a church of 10,000 people. They have a prayer meeting, 45 people show up. That shows you the immaturity and the ignorance of the church. It really does. And I was watching the other night, Wednesday night, I was in here. And I was in the back. And I was like, wow. There's like 300 people in here praying and seeking God and worshiping God. Man, it was power. It was one of our most powerful prayer nights was last weekend. It was unreal. And people go, and yes, listen, the enemy wants to dismiss it. Yeah, the enemy wants to dismiss it. He wants, oh, it doesn't matter. You go there and you sing. And, and we get all offended and weird about stuff. And, and then the enemy, isn't that how he works? He just starts distracting you away. He just starts distracting you away from the Lord. The enemy just, oh, yeah, you don't really need to pray. Isn't it funny that, that you can sit down? I go down into my office every morning at the house, and man, that computer's right there. Huh? YouTube. I'm going to go pray and read my Bible. I'm going to go sit with the Lord. And I start wondering, I wonder how nickels are made. 
where in the, why, why, did I wor- why am I thinking about nickels? So I put in how are nickels made? I typoed, it's pickles, comes up how pickles are made. Now I'm curious about how pickles are made, right? <clears throat> how are pickles made? Click, pickles, hour and a half go by, wow. Pickles are cucumbers? I didn't know, I hate pickles. I love cucumbers. What's the difference between pickles and cucumbers? You see that rabbit trails? And now I'm not reading my Bible. I didn't spend any time with Jesus, but man, I know a lot about pickles. <laughs> Ask me, get home that night. I wonder how nickels are really made. Let's put in the right word, nickels. The enemy will distract any man or woman from the place of prayer. He'll do anything in his power to keep you from, from being a person of prayer. That's the enemy's attack so, so, so hard against people that pray. Why? Because it is our element. We are in Christ. We're seated with him. We pray. We worship. We are in him. And the enemy's goal is to take us out of, just like that fish out of the water where we'll die. I'm not saying you're going to hell. You're just going to perish. Your marriage is going to suffer. Your kids are going to suffer. Your church is going to suffer because you get pulled out of the element that God has placed you in. He, the, the enemy wants to pull you out. It's like a man on the moon. How many know we can't live on the moon? We went to the moon and they had to come out in them suits, right? Some of you go, we never went to the moon. I don't want to get into all that. I watched that on YouTube though too for like eight hours one day. Watch it. Watch. Take off the helmet. What happens? Die. We live in a dry and weary land. We live in a place that is tough to live for God, but when we stay in Christ, we're like the man on the moon. We can live and thrive because we're walking and living in the presence of God. Don't let your enemy keep you from the secret place with the Lord, the place of immunity where you can live and have victory in Christ. Don't let the devil talk you out of your prayer life, out of the word, and out of being a worshiper. Amen. (laughs) And it's always, it's always the dumb stuff that causes people to leave. It's always, it, it, it amazes me. It, it, I, I'm always amazed within the church. I always say to the Lord, Lord, how are we ever going to have a great awakening and a revival when we get mad over chairs and carpet and lighting and sound systems and bathroom remodels? How are we ever going to face revival when we can't even love each other? How are we ever going to get there when we live so offended all the time? Oh, we, we, we don't need all these lights, and we don't need drums, and we don't need sound systems. I, I hear this stuff from people, not just from here, every church I've ever... It's, listen, two biggest things that separate the church, music and how loud it is. That is like the devil's greatest attack on the church right now. That's pretty dumb that he only has to use those two things. We're all wound up. And then we come in here to pray and worship. We can't pray and worship because we're too weirded out by what we don't like. I'm 50. I'll be 53 years old. I don't need lights. Look right here. I don't need lights. I can come in here with all the lights off and just pray and worship and have a great time. It doesn't, I don't care. I do like good sound. I don't like bad sound. But we let those things become dividers from the call of God on the church to pray and worship because we don't like that, we don't like this, and we don't like that. Now watch this. The enemy's got us swirling about over non-issues. All these young people with their drums. I hear it. I hear it. One of the greatest guys, there's a guy in our church, I won't say his name, 90, I don't know how old he is, 92, 96, I don't know. Awesome man of God. 
gave a ton of money to buy these speakers. 96 years old. I will almost bet you, if you had a conversation with him, that the style of music that's being played here is not exactly what he would choose. Do you know he's never once come to me and said, I paid for that sound system. I want to hear some... Give me that old-time religion in my soul. (laughs) He may love it. I don't know. I'm I'm in awe of the man. Because then I have 60-year-olds that are just... I can't do this. I can't pray and worship with all this banging. (laughs) Shall I get off my high horse? I shall. (laughs) Don't let the devil rob you, man. Punch him in the face. Yeah. Just, yeah. You start having those thoughts, just lift your hands a little higher. That's what I do. Enemy starts trying to get me to be distracted from seeking God in prayer and worship, and I'm in here, and he starts saying something to me. I just lift my hands a little higher, sing a little louder. And just, come on, guys. Last one, last roadblock, and this will be the most painful one. Roadblock number four, relational, horizontal problems. You have a vertical problem? You and the Lord got to deal with some stuff? You got eternal thing, internal things you got to work out. You got the enemy that you're fighting. And then we have the horizontal relationships between brother and sister in the church and, and people in your life that you need to forgive. I'm going to read you a few verses. Matthew 6, 5. Forgive, uh, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive the, uh, men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Ouch. That's Jesus talking. Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is so important. Guys, please don't ignore this. Please don't start thinking about tacos and hamburgers right now. I am. How do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? The relational things. Boy, that's the enemy's first place of attack on a church is to get people mad, offended, and then to pull other people into their offended group. And now the Lord's going, I want to do something and I can't because you're all upside down about where you're asked to sit. Hmm. There's churches in the world today that don't have sound. They're, they're in fear of their heads being chopped off every day. That's some real problems. Our problem isn't our air conditioning and the heating and the lighting system and the sound system. Guys, that's really pretty petty that we get upset about this stuff. And some of you are going, are there people upset about this stuff? Not really. A couple, a few. You know who you are. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't know anybody. I'm totally joking. I'm joking. I'm serious. I don't know anybody that's in this service that's, that's upset. I don't know anybody. Oh, God. I'm hungry. It's getting... I need food. So these relational problems, we get all upset at each other. And the Bible's very clear. It says, hey, if you're coming to pray and worship, you're coming to do your thing, and you just realize there's an offense, go fix it. Go fix it with your brother. Just... How many know none of us? I don't believe any of us are set out to hurt people. I think it just happens. It's like we just say something or, or you know, we're leading the church and something happens. Oh, man, I wish that wouldn't have happened. And you go to people, oh, man, forgive me. And then they forgive you. And then there's some people, they, forg- they don't forgive. I was just, there's just one person that I've been, and I'm super loyal. I, I love people, man. So when there's a relational problem with someone, I, I hate it. It really bothers me. Like, I want peace. I just want people to love each other. So, man, I will, I will, and so there's one person, I've called them three or four times and had conversations with them in the last 10 years. Hey, I'm really sorry. Man, if there's anything I did, forgive me. So about third or fourth time I hung up, the Lord said, let it go. You have done your part. 
if they don't want to forgive, that's on them. You have kept your heart right and you have dealt with it. Move on. But never does the Lord say this. Hey, you're upset at that person? Why don't you go grab eight or ten people in the church and have a conversation with them about it? And pray about it. Right? Don't you love those prayer groups? Are you guys praying about, oh, we're praying about Bobby's offense. Well, who's Bobby offended at? Timmy. Well, I think Bobby's supposed to go talk to Timmy, not all of you. Matter of fact, you praying about it, the Lord's, that's like a deaf ear prayer. Because that's not the order we're supposed to do this in. You go talk to him. You don't even got to pray about it. You don't even got to pray about it. It doesn't say pray about if you should go if you're offended. It says if you're offended, go. So I just go over, hey, man, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And they go, love you, love you too. That doesn't mean, listen, there are people you don't gel with. How many would you agree with that? Is there people that you just, you just don't, you don't gel with them. Look right here. That's okay. God's not asking us all to hang out with everybody and be best friends with everyone. Right? There are some people you just don't gel with. It's cool. But if you hate them, that's another thing. And how do you know if you hate them? When their mind comes across, or when their, their name comes across your mind, you think terrible stuff. You want their demise. That's how you know you have a problem. And you need to go to the Lord. Lord, heal my heart. Take this out of me. Help me. I'll read you a verse, 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. The Bible's pretty straightforward, huh? Someone told me, you're pretty straightforward. And I said, not as straightforward as the Bible. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hasn't seen? And this commandment we have from him, that uh, he who loves God must love his brother also. It's pretty clear. Some of the most spiritual people I know are some of the most hateful people I know. They look so spiritual, but they are so immature because they don't know how to deal with the relational problems, this horizontal issue that is so simple in Scripture. Just, just go and repair it. I'm sorry. How many, how many can say I'm sorry sometimes? How many of you ever make mistakes? Thank you. Thank you. Last little dilly. I want to talk real quick about marriage. Marriage, the horizontal issue with your spouse. First Peter 3 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, your spouse, with understanding. Give honor to the wife as to the... Some of you women won't like this next little part of the verse. As to the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. I'm going to really hit on something. I hope you don't leave the church. I really do. I don't want you to leave, but I really have to say this because I really believe this. Culture has done a real job on on men and women relationships, and it's all born out of pain and hurt. Women are just like men and can do whatever a man can do. Right? No, hold on. Hold on. You don't want to clap yet. I'm just... I don't want you to clap yet because I got to finish part B. We are not the same. We're not. Watch, watch, hold on. What I didn't say is women aren't powerful, women aren't, can't do this, and women can't. That's not what I said. What I said is women and men are different. And the world wants to make us all the same. Why? Because God in creation made us different so that we could walk together. And men in the, ten, in the like 20s, 30s, and 40s, it was really cool to like, to like power over your wife and, and be the Lord over your house and mean and rah, 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 rah. And it hurt women because they weren't loved and honored and cherished. So out of that wound came anger towards men. And then now what we have is a war between the sexes 
When God doesn't want a war between the sexes, he wants us to walk in unity. Why? Because one puts a 1,000 to flight, two, 10,000. So in our marriage, and if you're not married, just put this one in your back pocket for later. Watch this. One puts a 1,000. God doesn't use addition. He uses multiplication in the Bible. One puts a 1,000 demons to flight. Two puts 10,000. So why does the enemy attack your marriage? Because he wants to break the unity so that you don't pray. Watch, so that your prayers aren't hindered men. By the way, this commandment is to men in the Bible. Hey, men, love and cherish and honor your wife. Isn't that cool? See, all we hear is the weaker vessel part, and we get all spun out. We don't hear all the good stuff. Love, honor, cherish your wife so that your prayers aren't hindered. Some of us don't have good prayer lives because we don't have good relationships. How many times, Cindy, in the morning, we'll be getting, we're up and we're moving throughout the day and especially Sundays. Sundays, we don't talk. <laughs> we don't. We, we get up in the morning. It's pretty, I mean, we talk. But I'm normally up a couple hours before her, and so I'm ready, and I'll walk in the bathroom, and, you know, she's getting ready, and, you know, I, I'm getting ready, and she's, you know, she's, and she's getting ready, and, and we just keep the conversation real, real, real light. Why? Because we know the enemy and his devices and his tricks against us. We know that he wants us to argue and fight before church. Why? Because there's power and authority when we walk together. So maybe, maybe when we first got married 32 years ago, man, when we first got married, she would what's this? I go, what's what? So what's this? I go, my pants? She goes, why aren't they in the laundry basket? I go, they were by it. And then what do we start? We start fighting over pants. Find over pants in the basket or not in the basket. And then years of this. I'm not, I didn't get it. Years go by. And one day we finally realize this is dumb. She even said to me, I'm sorry that I, I make such tension over pants. It's been 32 years. The pants are still by the hamper. It's unlearnable. It's unlearnable for me. It just, I can't get them in the hamper. I try. I open it. I, I think they're in there. I go away. I come back. Why are my pants on the floor? Don't argue and fight with your wife. If you're going to argue, argue fair. I believe in arguing. There are people that say, oh, we never argue. Someone's lying. Keep that relationship tight. Don't let the enemy come in and mess with your marriage because, man, there is so much authority in the unity of a marriage. That's why God made it. It's beautiful. And the enemy has done everything to distort it and distort women and their uniqueness and distort men and their uniqueness. Of course women can do what men can do. Of course a woman can be a firefighter. Of course a woman can be a police officer, a lawyer, a doctor. That's dumb. But you know what a woman can't do? A woman and a man left to themselves without the beauty of this is really difficult. And I know women that will tell me, yeah, you know, I went through this whole thing and I didn't need a man and I'm starting to feel like I need a man. And by the way, please hear me. I'm not saying if you're single, you're not whole. Don't, don't hear me say that. But there is such power when we come together and we allow our differences to be a strength to one another her sensitivity is good for me because she'll just say rick you can't say stuff like that <laughs> why and she explains it and i go oh and then she needs me when something hit, when something's going down and i come over and she likes that strength and i'm there to cover her and bless her it's important i'll close with this thought worship team you can come out I know we're a little late, 12.07. I always love telling you the time, just so, just so you know. Then you don't have to look on your phones. 
God is the ultimate barrier breaker. He's the ultimate barrier breaker. Ephesians 2.14, for he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. The Bible says this, that before I met Jesus, before Jesus came into my heart, before I received his salvation, that, that I did not have peace with God. But Jesus, 2,000 years ago, when he died on the cross, he destroyed the barrier between me and the Father and between me and Jesus. And when I receive him, now I have complete peace with him and the hostility of anger and sin has been broken. And if you're in this place today, the ultimate barrier of your life is that you don't know Jesus Christ. It's the ultimate barrier. And there's only one way for that wall to come down and it's for you to receive Jesus because the wall is already down. He already knocked it down. You just have to receive what he has done for you. Amen.